So let's get started. We're going we're gonna to start in Philippians chapter 4. So if, if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 4, we're going to dig right in and we're going to start in verse 6. And uh, if you don't have your Bible, that's okay. Damon's going to put it up on the screen. So Philippians chapter 4. You guys ready? I'm ready or not. Here we go. Philippians chapter four, verse six. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Right there. I wanted to kind of focus on that. Let your requests be made known to God. God wants us to talk to him. He knows exactly what's going on in your life every second of every day, but he still wants us to invite him into our situations. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to talk to him. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So God wants us to talk to him. He wants us to to tell him what's going on in our day-to-day lives. But on the flip side of that, God also talks to us. God talks to his children. Do you all believe that this morning? Well, four people hear from God, everybody else, we're just, we're just trudging through life. God speaks to his children, he speaks to us. Most commonly, he speaks to us through his word, which is our Bibles. So we need to stay in the word, we need to continually read our Bibles. But he also speaks to us through dreams, visions, music we listen to, or, or something that we see that spurs a thought. And sometimes he uses people around us to speak to us. So as I, was, as I was preparing for this message, I was, I was praying for direction. God, what, what do you want me to say? I knew I had some pretty good advance notice that I was going to be able to get up here and speak with y'all. So I was praying and, and seeking God's plan for what he wanted to do this morning. God, what do you want me to preach? And he spoke to me very clearly. And he used a, a guy by the name of Mike Tyson to do it. If you don't know who Mike Tyson is, he's... He's one of the most dominant heavyweight boxers to to have ever fought in the ring. He's very, very powerful, very fast, and he's a very skilled boxer. Iron Mike was his ring name. So Mike calls me up one day, and he's like, hey, Josh, I got something to say. And I was like, okay, what's up, Mike? And y'all don't believe that. He didn't really call me because we don't talk that often. (laughs) But God did use Mike Tyson to inspire me for the, the idea of this sermon. I was, on my, I was on my way home from work one night. It was about 10.30 at night, and I was heading home and had a lot of windshield time, so a lot of time to myself to think and go over ideas for this sermon. And this quote from Mike Tyson came to mind. And the quote got me thinking, and it, and it inspired me on what God wanted me to, to speak to you all this morning. It got me thinking of how do we handle the situations that we face day to day? How do we handle the struggles that we go through in life. And the quote was, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Now, this is a truth that Mike Tyson knew all too well. Um, in his fight with Evander Holyfield, he had a plan. He had a plan. He was going to execute that plan. But after being dominated by Holyfield and continually punched in the face, his plan went out the window and he ended up biting off part of Evander Holyfield's ear. So that night, as, as this quote come to mind, and, and I'm, I'm continuing to think and pray about this idea that, that God is starting to resonate in my heart. I had to stop at Walmart on my way home, get a few things. At this point, well, that's a fight altogether. But at this point, it's like 11 o'clock at night. And uh, I get my stuff. And I'm standing in line. And I, and I look. And the man in the line next to me, he's got a shirt with Mike Tyson on it. And it's that exact same quote. He said, the shirt said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. So God speaks to us. We just have to, we have to listen. We have to, we have to listen. So, if we listen to God, he will speak to us. The great theologian Rocky Balboa said, nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Now, I'm still not sure if that's good advice, but it's... As I'm, as I'm going over these ideas in my head, some of this stuff comes to mind, so I thought I'd put it down on my notes. We all get punched in the face from time to time, and I'm not talking literally. I'm talking about 
the, the struggles of life, the things that come our way, things that happen to us. Life has a way of hitting us hard. Some of us, unfortunately, get hit harder than others, but life does have a way of hitting us all. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Well, that's, that's a great verse to start our week. Oh, in this world, you will have tribulation. It doesn't say, Jesus doesn't say you might have tribulation or, or you, eh, it could happen, maybe. No, he says you will. That's kind of disheartening. But the rest of that verse says, take heart, I have overcome the world. We get attacked spiritually, emotionally, financially, and physically. But our fight, our fight isn't with... Our fight isn't with the flesh and blood. Your fight isn't with your spouse that refuses to pick up his underwear off the bathroom floor. Your fight is not with the person that cut you off on the way to church this morning or your kids that won't keep their grades up or clean their room. Our fight is against spiritual forces of evil. For some of you, it might have been a fight just to get here this morning. Alarm clock goes off. Oh, I'm just going to hit the snooze button. It goes off again. Oh, let me hit the snooze button again. And then you finally realize, oh, no, i got to get up. It's time to get ready for church. So you start hollering at the kids, get ready. Yes, honey, that shirt looks fine. It's perfect. Brush your teeth. It's time to go. Why did you change? I said that shirt looked good. Get in the truck. Buckle up. And then you're going down the road. Yes, I see the light. I know it's red. I'm going to stop. Stop hitting your sister. Quit. You want me to pull this truck over? And then you pull in the parking lot. Yes, I see that parking spot. I don't want that parking spot. I want this parking spot. And then we get out and then we walk up the door. Hey, how are you? It's so good to see you. Oh, it's been such a great week. We all have fights. We all have fights. And some of them aren't as... Some of them are... I'm going to get in trouble. It's a... My wife's in... sitting in next service, so that's... Coming off the notes, it's okay. <laughs> Most of the time when we get punched in the face, however, like Mike Tyson said, your plan goes out the window. We resort to instinct. So what is your instinct when things go wrong? When life hits you in the face? When circumstance is, is difficult? What is your instinct? When the struggle seems overwhelming, do you dig in and swing for the fences? Do you just cover up and hope that you can endure the beating until it stops? Do you ask for help? Or do you throw in the towel and give up and run away? How do you fight? My instinct for me, my typical reaction is to handle things on my own, by myself. I have a hard time asking for help, so when a situation comes my way, I tend to, to dive in at the problem head first, which is usually a bad approach. And this is an area of my life that, that God has been working on me. He's, he's been pruning me. He's been, he's been working on me in this area. And I'm, I'm sure if he's working on me, he's working on some of y'all in the same area as well. So today we're going to look at our Bibles for a few, at a few scenarios where people had a fight come and how they reacted to these fights. All throughout the Bible, there's examples of, of people being dealt situation after situation and how they handled the struggles that they faced. Now, some of these examples show us how we should react, but some of these examples show us how we shouldn't react. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18 with me, and, and we'll get started. Some, that's some holy water. We got it for sale out there. It's good. A dollar a bottle. That's a good deal. So the stage is set. It's a showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. So in this corner, there's 450 prophets of Baal. And in this corner, we've got one Elijah. The challenge Elijah has is to prove to the people of Israel that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is the one true God. See, Israel had, had turned their hearts from God and they started focusing on this Baal. Elijah has his hands full. The prophets are to sacrifice a bull. The prophets of Baal, they've got their own bull. They're going to sacrifice it. Elijah has his own bull. He's going to sacrifice it. Only they're not going to, let, they're not going to set any fire to it. They're going to call to God from heaven to rain down fire. So the prophets of Baal are going to call to Baal, see if he will rain down fire on this, 
offering. Elijah is going to do the same to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's going to call down and see if God will rain down fire. So round one, it's the prophet's turn. They try, they cry out, they're, 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 they're screaming and, and praying. They start cutting themselves and nothing happens. So Elijah, he starts talking smack. He's like, well, cry out a little louder. Maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's taking a nap or, or, or maybe he's out for a walk or maybe he's even on the toilet. Why don't you just cry a little louder? And of course, nothing happens. Imagine that. Now it's Elijah's turn. Round two, let's see how Elijah handles this fight. Now we're in 1 Kings chapter 18 and we're going to start in verse 36. And at that time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. So Elijah does what we talked about in Philippians. He, he made his request known to God. See, he had a fight on his hand, but he, he asked for help on this one. He, did, he didn't take the, the fight into his own hands. He asked for help. He called to God, God, let these people know. And God responds. He responds mightily with fire from heaven that consumes the offering and it proved that he was the one true God. So Elijah gets the victory. He wins this fight. But then this, this angers Queen Jezebel. Those were her prophets and Baal was her God. Elijah just won a fight. He called down fire from heaven, but now he finds himself in another situation. Before he even gets a chance to celebrate the victory he just had, he's got He's got himself in another fight. The queen is mad and she wants to kill Elijah. Now 450 prophets, oh, that's no big deal. It's all in a day's work. But a crazy psychopath queen, that's another story. Let's see how Elijah handles this fight. He, he, he did real well in his last one. Let's see how he handles this one. First, king, First Kings 19.3 says, Then he was afraid of this little 116-pound queen. Then it doesn't say that, that I added that myself. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life. Just before all this, he called on the name of God and God answered. But then when Jezebel makes this threat, he doesn't even consider that an option. He just runs. This fight he took into his own hands and he lost. Now let's look at another, another set of examples. We're going to go back a little bit and we're going to look at King David. Now, David has had his share of fights. If you read the, the story of the life of David, he was fighting from the time he was a kid all throughout his life. He fought lions and bears. He fought Goliath, countless enemies and enemy armies. The king that he faithfully served before he came king tried to kill him repeatedly over and over again. David had many fights, many battles, now let's look at how he handled himself. Where we pick up the story, David has already established as king. And the Bible says that in the spring of the year, when kings went out to battle, David remained at Jerusalem. And if you'll turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11, we'll pick up the story. So David's already king. It was a long, hard fight to get to where he's at, but he's established as king. His army is out at battle, but he stays at home. Second 11, Second Samuel 11, 2. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Now in this moment, right then, David has a fight on his hands. He's got a fight on his hands. He, he, he sees a beautiful woman bathing and... and how many of y'all take a bath with your clothes on, right? So he's, he's got this struggle right now. He's, and ladies, I don't know if this is something that you struggle with, but men, we know that in this moment, the fight is on. But this isn't the type of fight, this, this is the type of fight that you can go through and somebody will never know it. It's, it's in our heads, it, it's in our hearts. The fight is on. So let, let's get something straight. He didn't sin 
by seeing her. We don't sin by seeing somebody that's attractive. It's, it's the steps that we take after that that will determine whether we're going to sin or not. It's that, that double take or that, that looking a little bit too long or, or allowing these thoughts to cultivate in your mind and to start to grow. David could have done anything. He could have asked for help. He could have sought the counsel of a trusted friend. He could, he could have got an accountability partner. He could have prayed for strength, but instead in this fight, he takes, he takes the fight into his own hands. He ended up sleeping with Bathsheba and, and she got pregnant because of it. And after she got pregnant, David ends up killing her husband Uriah, who, by the way, Uriah was, was one of David's most trusted soldiers. He lost this fight. He took it into his own hands and he lost this fight. So we're going to look again at David. David is referred to in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. So I don't want you all to leave with this story on your mind about David. Let's look a little bit further at David. So the next example, at this point in history, David has lost the kingdom. His son Absalom revolted and he took the kingdom by force and is currently pursuing David in an attempt to kill him. His very own son. You know, he, he brought Absalom into this world and Absalom is attempting to kill his father, all in order to gain the kingdom. So how does David react? He's got a fight on his hands. The kingdom's been stripped from him. His son is trying to kill him. How does he react? Does he, does he take matters into his own hand like he did with Bathsheba? Well, let's look. Psalm chapter 3. Psalm chapter 3. David's got this fight, and he can handle it any way he wants. Although he's running for his life, he still has an army of people around him, soldiers that, that, are, that, are, that are so faithful, they, they will stay with him till their dying breath. Psalm chapter 3 reads, O Lord, how many are my foes? And this, David wrote this when he was in a cave hiding from Absalom. King David, running and hiding in a cave. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Let's look at verse 4. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. He said he cried out to the Lord. He, he asked for help. It didn't work out too good with Bathsheba when he took the matter into his own hands, but he said this time I cried to God for help. Verse 5 says, I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Blessings be on your people. David didn't take the fight upon himself. He called on the Lord for help. He put the battle in God's hands. And because he leaned on God for what he needed, his kingdom was restored. He was, he was placed back into power. Absalom's revolt failed, and David was restored as king. Now we're going to fast forward a little bit. We're going to, we're going to jump to the Gospel of Mark. And here we see a situation where a man's son has an unclean spirit. And the Spirit has caused the man's son to go mute and, and it causes him to go into seizures and occasionally causes the boy to fall in fire or in, in water and attempt to destroy the boy. Now, how many of you know that it, when it comes to our kids being attacked, the gloves come off? If somebody messes with our kids, that's a whole other story. You can mess with me all you want, but you mess with my kids, I'm going to fight like crazy. We're going to fight like wild animals and we'll kick and scratch and bite through anything or anyone that wants to mess with our kids. So this is the, way, this is the place where the boy's father is at. He's, he's got no options. He's, he's, he's been fighting to try and help his son, and, and there's nothing he can do about it. So he asks Jesus for help. He says to Jesus, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus responds. I love Jesus' response in this. If I can do anything... If, if I, you didn't, you didn't see the news the other day? You didn't read about it? What do you mean, if I can do anything? All things are possible for one who believes. Then we, we look at Mark 9, 24 to see how this man fights his battle. 
Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. He did the only thing he could do. He cried out to Jesus for help. Help me. And if there's anything holding me back from what I need, help me with that too. He's crying out. He's, he's making his request known to God. Now let's look at, at what I think is one of the most important examples in our Bible of how to approach our struggles. We looked at, we looked at some examples of how not to approach our struggles. We have looked at a few examples of how we can approach our struggles. And in my opinion, this is, this is one of the most prominent examples in my Bible. Jesus has just eaten the Passover meal. He washed the disciples' feet. He, he broke bread and shared it with them. He points out that Judas is going to betray him and that Peter is going to deny him. He knows that his crucifixion and his death is getting closer and closer by the minute. He, he's got a fight on his hands. Our Savior, Jesus, God in the flesh, has a fight on his hands. So he goes to the garden, and it's here we see how we should fight our battles. In Matthew 26, 39, the Bible reads, And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed. God in the flesh, the creator of the heavens and earth, falls on his face and prays, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Here Jesus is teaching us what to do in the struggles we go through. We need to stop running from our problems. We need to stop fighting them on our own. We need to pray to the one who can help us. We need to make our requests known to God. So when I was, when I was a little bit younger, I did, I, did, I did some MMA. I had a few cage fights. And, and uh, there's a few things that I learned that can help us right now in the struggles that we face. So there's a few things that... that that I learned, one of the things you got to know is you've got to have your feet right. If you're in a fight, you can't be tripping over your feet. You've got to have your feet right. You've got to have a, a good base, a good foundation. That way, when the enemy attacks you, you're not, we're not going to trip. We're not going to stumble. We're not going to fall. And then, if we're in a fight, we've got to have our hands up. There's a few reasons for this. We want our hands up. We can block. If the enemy strikes us, we can block. But also, if our hands are up, if our feet are right, and our hands are up, we can protect ourselves, and we can also strike back. We can, we can take the fight to the enemy. So we have to have our footing. We have to have our base. We've got to have our, we've got to have our feet right. So we've got to have a good, firm foundation. We've got to get the proper base. We've got to, we've got to be ready for this fight. Then we need to keep our hands up because the enemy is going to attack us. We need our hands up. And we need to be able to attack back. We need to be able to attack back. Now this posture right here, it looks like surrender to us. We're on our knees. We've got our hands pointing to the sky. It looks like surrender to us. But when the enemy sees us like this, he says, no, they're ready. They're ready. They're, they're, they're ready to fight. They're coming at me. They're defending themselves and they're ready to fight. What looks like surrender is our only chance at victory. If we look at Philippians 4, chapter, again, chapter 4 again, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let your requests be made known to God. So when trouble comes your way and life gets messy, how are you going to handle it? When your marriage is falling apart, what are you going to do about it? When your child's addicted to drugs and far from God, what are you going to do? If the doctor says that you have cancer, how are you going to fight that? What if God makes a promise to you and it's been two and a half years and, and you still haven't seen the fruit of these promises and doubt starts to creep in and the enemy's telling you the same thing that he told Eve in the garden. Did God really say that? And you start to doubt yourself, did God really make that promise or, or am, I, am I crazy? Did God? And doubt creeps in. How are you going to handle that? How are you going to handle these fights? What if you go through bankruptcy or you lose a loved one? What about fear and doubt? What are we going to do about it? 
what we're going to do is we're, we're going to bow our knee, we're going to put our hands to heaven, and we're going to cry to the one who, who knows our situation, the one that can help us. We're going to say, God, help me, I need you. God, this fear is too much, this pain is too much to handle. God, heal my marriage, heal my body, Father God. I need you. God, I need you. This doubt, if there's anything in me that's holding me back from what I need, remove it from me. Cast out any doubt that I have. Now there's somebody in here thinking, well, that, that, yeah, that sounds good. But I've been, I've been going through this same fight for a long time. I've been dealing with these same health issues for a long time. You don't understand. My marriage has been on the rocks forever. You don't understand the, the, the nights I stayed up praying for my child. You don't understand the things we're going to. I just... I just don't feel the presence of God in my situation. It's been a long, hard fight, and I don't feel the presence of God. I feel abandoned. You don't feel the presence of God. What do you want? You want the hair on your neck to raise up? You want goosebumps? I get goosebumps every time I kiss my wife. That doesn't indicate the presence of God. Our feelings don't determine the presence of God. His Word tells us that He's present. He is there if we cry out to Him. The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, 6. It's all through the Bible. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, 9. The Lord your God is in your midst. Zephaniah 3, 17. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Joshua, Matthew 28, 20. God is with us and he's waiting, us for, waiting for us to cry out to him. And because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. I'll cry out to God, God, I'm drowning in my problems. My struggle is overwhelming me, but you are bigger than my problems. You are greater than my fears. You are mightier than my adversaries. Victory belongs to you. God will answer every prayer that you pray to him. Every single prayer you pray, he will answer. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's not yet. But he will answer you so long as you ask. You have to ask. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. But the, the Greek verbs used here, ask, seek, knock, these Greek verbs, they, they imply ongoing action. So we have to ask and then keep asking. We have to seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking. We have, to, we have to cry out to God, God, I need this and I'm not stopping until you give it to me. God, I need you in my situation and I'm going to just keep calling on you. I'm going to keep calling on you till you fix my problem or you take me from this earth. But I am not going to stop. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep seeking. I'm going to keep knocking. We need to be a church that fights. We need to be a church of prayer. Maybe the things I'm saying here this morning to you sound foreign. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're new to this whole church thing. You're not sure about it, but maybe there's something in your heart. There's, there's a pulling at your heart. There's, there's a struggle within you right now, and you don't, you don't know what it is. You don't know how to explain it, but there's, there's something tugging at your heart right now. Maybe you've never sur surrendered your life to Christ, but now is the time for that. Now is the opportunity if I could have everyone bow your heads as, as I prepare to close.